This morning I'll be reading from um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I've heard people say, you're gonna to have to decide whether you wanna win friends or influence people, because no matter what the book says, you can't do both. The book he's referring to, of course, is Dale Carnegie's bestseller, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And many people might agree with that sentiment. They believe that at least sometime in life, you have to choose between people liking you and people respecting you, but you can't have both. Well, I'm not so sure that that's the case, but if it were, which would you choose? Would you rather have people like you or respect you? Because the Bible places great value on both. It places great value on having unity in the church and with other people. We're told several times throughout the New Testament that we're, we're to get along with others. Romans 12, 18 says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live at peace with all men. And Mark 9, 50, Jesus said, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. So it's important to, to have people like you. But at the same time, the Bible also places a premium on remaining true to your convictions, no matter what. Colossians 2.16 says, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink. Galatians 1.10 says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, what should we try to do? Win friends or influence people? What is better, to have someone's friendship or to have their respect? Jesus was respected by all those who knew him. He had enemies, yes. They resented him, they hated him, they tried to destroy him, but when you read the Gospels, you can see that they also had respect for him. When you read how in the middle of the night, dozens of soldiers carrying torches and weapons stormed a secluded garden to arrest an unarmed man who was knelt in prayer. It's obvious that Jesus was respected even by his enemies. When you read the scene in which Christ stood before Pilate facing death and this high-ranking government official is, is unable to hide his admiration for this carpenter king. And people respected Jesus. He's also dearly loved. Of all the leaders the world has ever seen, political or religious or otherwise, none have been loved like Jesus. When he was on earth, he attracted huge crowds. Children loved him, they flocked to him. Sinners and people that everybody else rejected in the world felt comfortable around him. Leaders looked up to him. They all saw in him something that they liked. So if anyone ever achieved this delicate balance between being liked and being respected, it was Jesus. He always knew where to draw the line. He knew how to win friends and influence people to a, a degree that Dale Carnegie can never even imagine. But here in Philippians 2, Paul shows us how Jesus did that. He challenges us to live our lives in the same way, to have the same attitude that, that Christ had. That's what he said in verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. And so when you look at that, when you look at what Jesus' attitude was towards other people, then it's easier to see how he earned people's respect. And so this passage reveals three different aspects of Jesus' attitude that we are challenged then to, to take as our own, to use that as an example. So first of all, having the attitude of Christ means that we say that the world doesn't revolve around me. This is the attitude of selflessness. 
read a story in Reader's Digest about a flight being canceled due to bad weather. And one solitary agent was trying to rebook all of the, the travelers whose schedules had been totally messed up. Well, one passenger became impatient and pushed his way to the front and he slammed his ticket down on the counter and said, I have to be on this flight and I have to have first class. And the agent politely said, well, I'm sorry, sir, I'll help you as soon as I can, but I have to take care of these other people first. And the man became very angry and he shouted, do you know who I am? And uh, without hesitating, the agent then picked up the loud, uh, loud speaker microphone and he said to the hundreds of people that were there in the terminal, may I have your attention, please? We have a passenger here at the gate who doesn't know who he is. If anyone, <laughs> if anyone can help him find his identity, please come to the gate. <laughs> The man backed off and the people burst into applause all around him. So regardless of who that man was, whether he was rich or famous or maybe a little bit of both, he did not have the respect of those people in the terminal. It's hard to respect someone who considers themselves the most important person in the world and who puts uh, his needs above everybody else's. So compare that with this attitude of Jesus as we read in verse 5. As your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Now, something to be grasped means that, that, that it's a right that you have, that you feel you need to hold on to, a privilege that you have that you have to hold on to selfishly. In other words, Jesus refused to act like the world revolved around him. It's interesting that this should be his attitude because the world actually does revolve around him. <laughs> he really is the center of the universe. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 1 Corinthians 8.6 says, There is one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we lived. Jesus had the right to, to act like the world revolved around him, but he didn't. There are some things that once you have that you don't have to hold on to to keep. This equality with God that Jesus had from the foundation of the earth is one of those things. Jesus is the crown of creation. This is his world, he created it. Jesus is equal to God, he is God. Of all that exists on heaven and on earth, Jesus Christ is the most important. But he didn't have to grasp onto that to ensure that he always had that preeminence. He just has it. And so when he came to earth, he didn't have to act like everybody had to bow down to him, even though everybody should have. Instead, his attitude was always, others come first. And this is how he is the example for us of how to win the respect of others. Now, this is the opposite of what many people think about how to win the respect of others. Many try to win respect by demanding it, by insisting that their authority be recognized, that their authority be prioritized, by asserting themselves into the forefront and pushing their way ahead of everybody else so that people will say, well, that, that person's a real go-getter. I wish I could be more like that. Well, that attitude might win you some admiration. It might cause others to, to envy you and, and uh, the wish that they could be like that. But it doesn't win you respect. Just because you have obtained authority does not mean that you've won respect. People will respect you more when you use the authority that has been granted to you for whatever reason to use that authority to not serve your own interests, but the interests of others. Even though you may deserve respect simply because of the position that you hold, you won't get it by insisting on it. You win it by putting others first and yourself last. You win respect by giving respect to others that you want to respect you. And you don't keep it by doing whatever you can to hold on to it, by grasping onto it. Rather, you keep it by having that attitude of Jesus and giving respect to others by putting their needs above your own. Now, there will be some I know who, who just disagree with that, and they will say that, well, people will just take advantage of you and walk all over you, and that would cause them actually to lose respect for you. Well, I'm not saying to just let yourself be taken advantage of. And yes, there are people who will abuse your kindness and your consideration to the point where you might have to put your foot down and not let them get away with that. You just have to do that with some people. But in most cases, with most people, people would do anything out of respect for you because you have shown them that you would do anything for them. You won the respect because you don't have that attitude that the world revolves around you. Joanne C. Jones wrote about a pop quiz that she had during her second year of nursing school. 
She said, I breezed through all the questions until I read the last one, which was, what is the first name of the woman who cleans your school? Surely this was some kind of joke. I'd seen the cleaning woman several times, but how would I know her name? I handed in my paper, leaving the last question blank. Before the class ended, one student asked if that question would count toward our grade. Absolutely, the professor said. In your careers, you will meet many people. All are significant. They deserve your attention and care, even if all you do is smile and say hello. She writes, I've never forgotten that lesson. I also learned that the cleaning woman's name was Dorothy. When you take the time to learn the name of the cleaning lady, or to pay attention to the person who works for you, or the person who might be the lowest rung on the ladder. Kids are today, teenagers, if you're here, if, if you're kind to that person that everybody else in the school is making fun of, you will find that you have won something of immeasurable value. May not be popularity, may not be achievement, but it will be respect. There's an old song some of you might remember when you were younger. It says, Lord, let me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer will be for others. Others, Lord, yes, others, let this my motto be. Lord, let me live for other people that I may live like thee. Having the attitude of Christ is realizing that the world does not revolve around me. Secondly, having the attitude of Christ that wins respect is to say, I will help wherever I'm needed. This is the attitude of service. Verse seven of our passage says, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Another translation said that he emptied himself. This means that, that Jesus surrendered the independent use of his divine attributes. He still possessed them as a human being. He was still God in every sense of the word, but he only used his divine attributes under the control of the Holy Spirit and within the will of a heavenly father for this earthly life that he lived. In fact, there's no indication from scripture that he ever used his divine power at all during the first 30 years of his life. It was only after the spirit came upon him at his baptism that he began to use any divine attributes. And that was only when there was a divine purpose. Otherwise, everything Jesus did on earth was with that attitude of a servant. His purpose for being here was to serve and not to be served as he said himself. He also said, no servant is greater than his master. So if our master came to be a servant, then our calling is to be a servant too. We should always be looking for opportunities to serve. I read a story of a 85 year old lady named Margaret and at her 85th birthday celebration, it was clear to all present that Margaret had lost none of her zest for life. What advice would you have for people your age? Margaret was asked. Well, said the old lady, at our age, it's very important to keep using all of our potential or it dries up. It's important to be with people and to be of service to people as much as possible. Then Margaret was asked, well, exactly what do you do from day to day? To which 85 year old Margaret replied, I look after an old lady in my neighborhood. 85 year old lady looking after an old lady. <laughs> That's what service is all about. 85 year old lady taking care of her own son with Parkinson's. That's what service is all about. That's what a servant does. A servant says, I'll do whatever I can, whenever I can, to help where I can. During the American Revolution, a man in civilian clothes rode past a group of soldiers repairing a small defensive barrier. Their leader was shouting instructions, but making no attempt to help them. Asked why by the rider, he retorted with great dignity, sir, I am a corporal. The stranger apologized, dismounted, and proceeded to help the exhausted soldiers. The job done, he turned to the corporal and said, Mr. Corporal, next time you have a job like this and not enough men to do it, go to your commander in chief and I will come and help you again. It was none other than George Washington. That's the attitude that will win respect. And that was Jesus' attitude, the attitude that we are to imitate, that of a servant. Jesus said in Matthew 20, whoever wants to become great among you must become your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. He also said in Luke 22, 27, I am among you as one who serves. Now, even service can be kind of self-serving. Um, there are three possible attitudes that you could have when you serve somebody. One is that of reaching up, sort of a, an ingratiating attitude that says, well, I'm doing this so that you'll like me, or I'm doing this so that you'll owe me. <laughs> 
The second that is that of reaching down, kind of a more of a, of a condescending attitude that says, I'm doing this because I'm better than you. I'm doing this because you're down there and you need my help. Aren't you lucky I'm here? Then the third attitude, that is the one of Jesus Christ. That is of, of reaching out. It says, I'm doing this because you're my brother, you're my sister. And it's easier to respect someone who helps you but still treats you like an equal at the same time. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, writes about the difference between self-righteous service and true service. You can serve, but do it with the wrong attitude. He writes this, self-righteous service comes through human effort. True service comes from a relationship with the divine other deep inside. He's talking about the Lord. Self-righteous service requires external rewards. True service rests contented in hiddenness. Self-righteous service is highly concerned about results. True service is free of the need to calculate results. Self-righteous service picks and chooses whom to serve. True service is indiscriminate in its ministry. Self-righteous service is affected by moods and whims. I'll help when I feel like it. But true service ministers simply and faithfully because there's a need. Self-righteous service is temporary. True service is a lifestyle. Self-righteous service is without sensitivity. It insists on meeting the need even when to do so would be destructive. I'll help you if you, even if you don't want me to. But true service can withhold the service as freely as perform it. Sometimes the best service you can do for somebody is not to help. Self-righteous service fractures community. True service, on the other hand, builds community. So the attitude of Christ then is that of true service, to say, I'll help wherever I'm needed. And then thirdly, having the attitude of Christ means that we say, if I have to suffer for what is right, then I will. This is the attitude of sacrifice. Verse eight says, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Being obedient was the most important thing to Jesus. Being obedient is one thing, but Jesus was obedient to the point that he suffered and died the most awful death imaginable, the death on the cross. But he was never afraid of the consequences of doing good, of his obedience. He made enemies among the Pharisees when he healed people on the Sabbath, and that, that got the ball rolling for them to, to crucify him. And ultimately, it cost him his life. But it didn't keep him from doing what was right. In 1933, a German theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer created a lifelong enemy when during a live radio broadcast, he denounced an ambitious young politician by the name of Adolf Hitler. After Hitler came to power, Bonhoeffer was banned from speaking and writing and lecturing. By then, he had written two books that had given him an international reputation as a bold and daring Christian thinker. In 1939, during a visit to the United States, he was invited to stay here and to teach. The offer was an attractive one. He certainly would have been able to enjoy a level of popularity and prosperity and freedom that he could not have had in Germany. But instead, Bonhoeffer went home. He said that he must because his place was with, was with his own countrymen during this difficult time. And he spent the next four years teaching and secretly working against the Nazis and, and helping to smuggle Jews out of Germany. Eventually, he was arrested for his so-called subversive activities and he was sent to prison. And just weeks before the end of the war, he was executed. It all seemed so simple. All he had to do was stay in America when he had the chance. All he had to do was just keep his opinions about Hitler to himself. He could have had a good life, but he refused to ignore the task that God had called him to. He knew his responsibility was to go back to Germany and to help those who were oppressed by the Third Reich. This man understood what it meant to have the attitude of Christ. And as far as Dietrich Bonhoeffer was concerned, being helpful was more important than being comfortable. And though he actually gave up his life, he won a place of respect in history. And he left a legacy that will remain long after any of us are gone. That's the attitude of Christ. And you can't help but respect it. If we could only adopt this same attitude, then we will win the respect of the world. They may disagree with us. They still may mock us and scorn our Savior and scorn the love and the faith that we have. But when they see that we are willing to suffer for the sake of obedience to God, they cannot help but respect that. Now, most of us will not have to allow ourselves to be killed for Jesus' sake, although we might. Who knows what's coming up in the future? But still, 
we are asked to sacrifice our lives for him. We are to consider our lives as being spent for God already. We, when we die to ourselves and we consider everything else as lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ, as, as Paul would go on to say later in Philippians, then we have gained more than we could ever lose. In the words of another modern Christian martyr, and there are a lot of modern day Christian martyrs, Jim Elliott, um, who most of you know his story, went to South America and was killed by those that he very came to, to bring the gospel to. But he had this, this quote that has followed him long after his death. It says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let me say that again. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. When you've gained respect from others, then you open the door to sharing your faith and to winning them to Christ, which really is our mission on life on this earth. And as we see from the example of Jesus Christ, the way to win respect is through these attitudes of selflessness and service and sacrifice. It comes through serving the needs of others rather than demanding that your own needs be met. There's just too much of that going on today, demanding that my rights be observed and my rights be kept and my rights be met rather than serving what is best for other people. It is my prayer that you and I can gain and win and earn the respect of others so that we can win them for Jesus. That's why we want to do this and to bring them into this incredible life that we share as Christians, a life of selflessness and service and sacrifice. It's not an easy life, but it's the best life there is. 